Hi everybody, today I want to talk about common Canvas mistakes. These are things that you should never do in Canvas. Now typically in my tutorials I teach you about interesting things that you can do and interesting effects and styles that you can add to your content pages. But today we're going to talk about things that we should avoid when we're teaching in Canvas. So the first thing is that you should never use tables to lay out your content. And I know it's a temptation and this was actually the proper thing to do many years ago is to put things in a table, put your content in a grid, and a table is a grid. And so then you can put different icons and content things into the different table boxes, the table cells. And that's just really not a good practice. Today, in the era of accessibility, we want to ensure that tables are used to disseminate content, to sort information, but not to organize visual elements on your Canvas page. Now let me show you an example of what I'm talking about. And this is from a MOOC offered several years ago. This was actually the first MOOC that Canvas developed in the Canvas network. And I definitely don't want to vilify in structure because at the time this was an acceptable practice and it actually looked pretty good. But going forward today, we know that this isn't something that we should replicate. So this is the course. It was an introduction to social media, and you can see that the home page is laid out in something of a grid format, and this was done through a table. Now let me go and I'm just going to inspect one of these elements on the page right here. And I know this might seem confusing, but I can see in the behind the scenes that this is a table with various rows. And as I hover over, I can see the different cell items and I can hover over the rows. And so I can see that this was done. For example, they added space between the first three elements and the second three elements by putting in a row. And then probably they had nothing in there. So that row is just cells filled with spaces. That way they could space apart all of the different elements. And so visually it works, kind of. Um, but today in the day of screen readers and accessibility, we really want to eschew this practice. And if you really want to organize your content in a grid format, then you can see one of my tutorials or the blog post on how to use Bootstrap in Canvas. It's going to be a much better approach and it's screen reader friendly and it's also responsive and so that it looks good on mobile devices in addition to large monitors. So never use a table in Canvas unless you're using it for the purpose of having a table. So sortable content and categorization, that kind of thing, not for layouts. The next thing we see is a lot of times in Canvas we have content that just lacks focus. It doesn't tell a story. And so I have some questions that I'm going to ask you and bear with me. I, it's going to seem like pretty easy questions, but let's think about them for a second. So the first one is who is the target demographic? And think about a particular Canvas page that you're creating. It could be the entire course, but I would just really streamline it to a page. Who is the target demographic for that page? And what are the goals of this Canvas page? What are you trying to accomplish? And how will I drive traffic to this Canvas page? Now these seem like very silly questions, but just bear with me. You know that your target demographic is going to be your student body, the people who are in your class, enrolled in this class. And what are the goals of the Canvas page? Well, you're the teacher, so your goal is probably to teach. How are you gonna drive traffic to this Canvas page? Well, the students are enrolled in your class and this is class material, so they need to access it. It seems like easy answers, but really think about it for a second. These are questions that web developers often ask themselves as they're creating a website. They want to drive traffic to the website. They want people not only to go to the website, but to actually read the content on the website. Now, I think this is a mistake that we make in education thinking that the students are enrolled in my class, so of course they're accessing the content that I'm creating. Of course, they're going through Canvas and they're reading all of the words that I put on the page. They're probably reading it five times because my students are awesome. I mean, that's an assumption that we make, but we really have to know our students and know what motivates them. So really think about how your course content must address the needs and motivations of the student and not your own agenda. Today in education, whether it's K-12 or higher education, we're past the point of stage on the stage. We really need our content and our courses to tell a story, to motivate the learners. We need to apply it to real world situations and put it in a holistic context and so that they can see the full story. We as educators today are not just disseminators of wisdom and information, but we are storytellers. And the way that we put content into our Canvas pages, whether it's an assignment, even discussion post instructions, or a content page, needs to tell a story and it needs to captivate the audience. 
And so with that mindset, go and ask these questions again. Who really is my target demographic? What are their stories? What are the personas who are taking my class? And that even might change from one semester to another semester, from one section of a class to another section of the class. And what are the goals and how are you going to drive traffic to that Canvas page? I want you to dwell on that question in particular. How are you going to incentivize, motivate students to spend time in your Canvas course? Because even though they're enrolled in your course and they're paying tuition and they're motivated for that final grade, you still have to drive traffic and motivate your viewers. Here's another thing for you to think about. Your content really needs to be scannable because Canvas is a website and it's on the internet. And the reality is that the studies research has looked into how much time people spend online on a website. And what many studies have shown is that at most, people read about 28% of the content on a web page. And that's at most. More reasonably, they might read 20% or even less. Now we would hope that in Canvas, since there are students, since they are enrolled in our class, that they would read more. But even if they read twice as much as the maximum average viewer of a website, you're still looking at around half of the content. And our goal, we would like our students to read all of the content, maybe even multiple times. But the research shows that that probably just doesn't happen. And so we can design our contents to facilitate that and create scannable pages. Now, research has also shown that if there's a table on the page, people read that in a lawnmower fashion. And so they'll go from top left and they'll scan to the right. And this is in Western cultures where we read from top down, left to right. And then they'll go down and they'll scan from right to left. And then they'll scan from left to right again, kind of like as if you're mowing a lawn. So let's look at an example of how I might set up my homepage, for example. It might be tempting for me to put a lot of information on there, but instead, you know, I already have to compete with the Canvas format in that we have global navigation, we have course navigation, we have some breadcrumbs, and by the time I get to the content that I've actually created, I'm relegated to a relatively small amount of real estate. And so I need to optimize that real estate. And so this page here is pretty typical of how I might set up a home page in one of my courses. I'm going to have a graphic and that graphic has contrast to the outside areas because I really want to pull in their attention and I want it to be something meaningful, but I don't want it to be so complicated that they only look at the graphic and they never advance to the text. And so I want to capture their attention and then steer them down. And then I'll have some text, not too much text, and we'll talk about that as well. And then I like to be clear about the navigation. Where do my students go to start the course, for example? Where can they find information about the modules and the sequence of the course? I don't want to bombard them necessarily, but I do want to have some comprehensive content there so that they can know where to go. So another mistake that we're still seeing in Canvas are pages that are not accessible. And when you're editing a page, whether it's an assignment or discussion or a wiki page, then in the editing view in the bottom right hand corner, you're going to see a graphic with an accessibility icon. And if there are accessibility issues on that page, then you're going to see a marker right next to that icon. And pay attention to that. You'll want to click on that and you'll want to address all of the issues that come up. It might be text that doesn't have enough contrast or an image that doesn't have alternative text. So that little icon is our friend because that ensures that certain elements of accessibility are met on our page. And if your institution has integrated you do it, then that's also a fantastic resource. That's a way that you can check the accessibility of your entire Canvas course all at one time. You can scan a report and then you'll have different errors highlighted or warning suggestions. And it's an easy interface where you can address most of these things right in one window without having to jump around from one page to another page looking for accessibility issues. It's also a good idea when you're doing course development to adhere to certain guidelines. And that could be QM or Quality Matters. If you're in the SUNY school district, then they use OSCAR, and that's available for everybody to use as well. The Online Learning Consortium has developed Qtip, which is a great platform because it focuses not only on course development, but also teaching. And California has QOLT, and I don't know if they call that something or if they just use the initials, but there are various guidelines that will help you in course development and really focusing on those issues of accessibility. So next I wanna talk about issues with images. And one of the issues is using too many images or even too many words on your slide. 
And here's an example of what that might look like. And this is actually a course in Canvas that I've seen out in the wild and they integrated Google Slides onto the homepage. And so this was the homepage and I simplified it and I want to mention that it's a fantastic course, a fantastic teacher, a fantastic school. But we just wanna be mindful that sometimes a lot is just too much. And so you want to be maybe sparing, but even more than sparing, you wanna be strategic about how you use images on your Canvas page. Remember, images are not glitter, and so we wanna be mindful of the placement. Another issue we might come into is the polar opposite of what we just talked about, which is not enough images. Now, I don't want to imply that we need to put pictures on our pages just for the sake of having pictures, but they really can enhance the narrative of our course content. And when you use it strategically, it can help you tell that story. Now, just look at this page right here. Obviously, it's lorem ipsum, so it's not really real content. It's not authentic, but imagine how motivated you would be to just read through all of those words. And for me to tell you, you got to read this because I'm the teacher and that's something that you need to do. Now here's that same content. It's still a lot of content, but I added a banner and this is just the banner that I made. It probably took me four minutes in a platform called Canva, not Canvas, but Canva without the S at the end. And you could create something similar in PowerPoint or if you have Photoshop or something sophisticated, but it's just something to place it at the top so that it gives me some sort of branding. It gives me a theme for the page. And then these other images I just grabbed from Unsplash just to kind of break up the content but I would assume that these images are relevant to the material that I'm teaching. You wanna to add to your page to add some storytelling capabilities, but just don't overdo it. You don't want too, too many images, but you wanna do it the right way. Now, another issue that I see sometimes with faculty is that they use very big images. Now they might shrink them down so that on the Canvas page, they don't seem very big, but the file size actually is significant in that not all of your students have high-speed internet. You know, that's, that's a reality, is that we need to be mindful of bandwidth. And even if the picture looks really small on a Canvas page, it might be a very large file size. Now I have an example down here. This is a pretty large image. And right now it's only the width of the screen, but in reality, it's much larger than that. This is about 7,000 pixels wide originally, and I uploaded it like that. Now that's a tremendously large image. That's like 76 inches wide. So that's like a poster, you know, that you might print and put on your wall. And I uploaded it into Canvas. And some people might think if you go into edit, and I'm gonna make that image smaller and so, cause I don't really need it all that big. But in reality, the best practice is not to upload a large image and make it smaller. Now you do want it to be high resolution. You don't want to have a small image and blow it up bigger cause then it'll be pixelated. But if I were to say, I'm gonna make this picture 350 pixels, great, now it's a small image. It's really not a small image and it's gonna take your students a long time for their computers to download the image unless they have very high speed internet. And it's also not very friendly to students that have mobile devices. So my rule of thumb, unless I'm uploading a banner that I know is gonna span the entire width, in that case, it might be a thousand pixels, but I like to keep my images to maybe 600 pixels. And so I might take a large image from Unsplash, for example, and save it to my computer and make it smaller and then upload it into Canvas. So one last mistake that I'm gonna point out that people often make with images is they have imagery that has words with them. And I'm gonna hop back over once again to my Canvas course here, and I created an image that has words. And this is just generic. I just created this in PowerPoint and saved it as an image, but you can see it has, it's a process of some sort, and it has various steps and feedback loops, and it's a very visual way to present this information. And that's not bad. I could keep this image perhaps, but I need to make sure that my alternative text, but I need to make sure that my alt text is very descriptive and that all of the content that we see on this image is also supported in the narrative of the page content. In other words, I'm not gonna rely entirely on this image to convey that information to the students. And that's very tempting because you might find some very good images that say exactly what you want to say and you'll put them in your course. But know that that would be a supplement and it's really not a great practice to begin with because this might look good to you and me watching this on YouTube, but if you're watching this video on a mobile device, then those words might be very small and you can't even read them. Now Canvas is gonna adjust the words on the page so that they look good on mobile, but Canvas can't commit to altering a picture so that the words are legible because that's just not how images work. 
And I've seen so many professors use images that have words that are simply too small. Unless you were to blow it up on a projector, maybe in a classroom, and stand right next to the screen, then maybe you could read it. But it's just something to eschew altogether is any image that has words in it. Now for the last common canvas mistake, we're gonna hop back out to the modules page. And sometimes teachers get responses from students saying, I can't access this content, or I can't even access this module. Now you wanna check before the course goes live that the content that students need to access is published. And you can do this in the module view. I can see that these pages aren't published, so if I click here, then I can publish those. But even so, none of the students are going to be able to see this content because the module is unpublished. Now you can publish these individually on the pages. For example, if I go to this page, then I can click publish. But it's a good approach if you use modules to just go through the modules and make sure the content is published. And sometimes I do put pages within a module that I don't want students to see. It might be notes for myself. And so I'll leave that unpublished. But then you'll notice something. If I unpublish a few of these pages and then I go to publish the module, it's going to publish not only the module, but all of the content in the module. And so then I want to go through and make sure that I have unpublished those things that I don't want students to see. So if you ever get a message from a student saying, I can't access this content, a lot of times you'll want to make sure that that content is published. A lot of times you want to make sure that that content is published. And the modules page is a great place to do that. So I've spent a lot of time telling you what not to do, but I'm going to give you a bonus tip. And that's something that will help you with your course development process. And you don't have to do this, but this is an approach that I use. And so I want to share that with you. I'm going to go and hide some of these courses so that we can really focus on on just one course and suppose I'm in the course development process and I'm ready to build the course. I have my syllabus, my prospectus, my course map, everything's all created. A lot of times what I do before, a lot of times what I do is I start in the calendar of all places. And if I say that I know that every Wednesday we're going to have a discussion post, for example, I can go in and put a placeholder and you don't even have to say the right thing. I can just say, this is my week one discussion, for example. I'm not going to publish it. I'm not even going to go to more options. All I'm going to do is submit that just so that I have the assignment and the date on the calendar. And if you make a mistake, you can click to drag and drop and move it to a different day. But I'll just go through my course and put in my assignments. Now, the great thing about Canvas is that once I put that in there, it syncs to not only the assignments, but the syllabus inside your course and the gradebook. And if you make a change in any one of those places, then that change updates everywhere. And so I might start in the calendar, but I don't finish in the calendar. I'll start in the calendar and then I'll move on to the assignment pages and put in the details for the assignments. And then I'll head over to the syllabus and the gradebook and make sure that everything looks good. The Canvas calendar is a great way to scaffold your course. So anyway, these are some of the most common mistakes that I see in Canvas. And so I want to help you so that you can avoid these mistakes, that you can help other people. Feel free to share this video with your colleagues and your instructional designers. And also please subscribe to this channel. I'm not going to do many more videos on mistakes, but most of my videos are geared around tutorials, teaching you how to do things and how to create things in Canvas. And if you hit that like button, that'll be fantastic. Feel free to chat with me on social media. And until next time, Happy Disney Morning!